Hi, all. <laughs> Welcome to the, um, the third Chris Peterson Memorial uh, Lecture. So we have actually really good turnout today. So you know, um, I'm really delighted to you know, um, the host today's event and introduce our uh, speaker today. Um, before I do that, I would like to make a few acknowledgments. And um, there are people actually who made this actually uh, today's event possible. You know, um, Department Chair um, Perry and the um, administrative staff, uh, Shemelia and the Jennifer. And without their help, we could not actually <laughs> held this together. And also committee members, the uh, Phoebe Ellsworth and the Al Kane. Um, so thank you all. Uh, we also actually have a special guest in this audience. Uh, Chris's family are here with us, and his brother, Carr, and he, um, his sister-in-law, um, the Patty. So thank you for coming. Um, and I usually actually don't <laughs> write um, introduction, but today's a speaker, he has so much accomplishment. You know, <laughs> you know I don't want to miss out. So um, it is my great uh, pleasure and honor to introduce you know, the, um, Dr. Keltner. Um, he is a, a professor of psychology at UC Berkeley, and he's a, a founding faculty um, the director for uh, Greater Good Science Center um, at Berkeley. Um, what we remember and miss about Chris is that not only his um, you know, a scholarly accomplishment, but who he was and how he lived. And I cannot think of actually any other speaker who embodied the spirit of Chris, you know, um, like Dr. Kettner. So you know, um, it is really, we are really lucky to have him here today. Um, um, there's no way I can actually summarize his accomplishment in such a short time. If you actually Google, um, you can get like something like 23,800 results as of yesterday. So I don't know how many, you know, even more today. Um, so I try to do, you know, um, you know, you know um, as much as I can, and I'll talk about actually, you know, some of my favorites. So um, the the his um, so he's not. Um, you know, only actually, you know, um, and his accomplishment is not just in you know, research and teaching, but actually service, you know, especially for a public uh, service is actually, I think, you know, uh, one of his uh, big accomplishments. So he's actually excel in research, teaching, and service in you know, uh, all this area, not only in you know, uh, quality, but also quantity. Um, first, his research focuses around theme of why and how of being and doing good. Um, so um, he studies the human emotions such as compassion, or embarrassment, gratitude, you know, love, teasing, and also power and morality, and the, um, the, um, their origins and consequences in importance in the domain of our life. And he's one of the leading scholars in the study of facial expression. He's a prolific writer. Um, his work has been published in numerous research articles and best-selling textbooks and in the best-selling trade books. Some of his books include uh, The Born to be Good and The, uh, the Compassionate Instinct. And uh, recently he wrote actually a book about the power, um, the power Paradox. I read actually some of these books. Actually, it's, they are outstanding. Um, He's also outstanding teacher and mentor. You know, um, some of the students he mentor are now actually you know, leaders in their own field. And he's a, a student are not only actually in his classrooms, he reach um, you know, students around the globe. You know, um, the one of the classes he teaches is a science of happiness. This is a free online class. And you know, I think this year, um, it reached to over 400,000 students. So his impact is a, really is, is, is a global. Um, um, the, he also actively shares his uh, knowledge to make a difference in the society. Through Greater Good Science um, Center, he translates research findings to help ordinary people to live a healthy, happy, and meaningful life. And I would like to uh, mention um, you know, one of the things actually he did um, that I think is, is worth it to, um, to mention. He wrote a brief for a court case that uh, led to reducing use of solitary confinement um, in maximum security prison in California because solitary confinement is actually inhumane treatment for uh, prisoners. And I also like to mention about some of the cool things that he did. Um, he collaborated with actually Hollywood to, um, in, in the process of making the animation movie <laughs> Inside Out. I thought it was uh, really fun. So okay, these are the things actually you can easily find out from you know, Googling in the internet. 
And these are the impressive, actually, list of accomplishment by one person. But that's not the reason, actually, why I admire him. He's not only the um, you know, smart guy, but he's a really nice guy. <laughs> and so he not only actually study human goodness, he, he lives it. And I think that's really, you know, uh, connects the spirit of, you know, the Chris. And I heard that when he was a graduate school, some faculty thought that someone that nice cannot be smart. I'm so glad that he proved them to be wrong. And he proved, <laughs> <laughs> he proved that actually, you know, uh, nice guys, you know, uh, can and do finish it first. And I think that actually perhaps the reason, you know, uh, he made all this accomplishment is because he's a nice guy, not in spite of, you know, um, you know, in spite of it. Um, you know, one of the last comments I want to uh, make about today's talk is about topic. It has a special meaning. And a few days before uh, Chris uh, passed away, uh, we were actually walking to the uh, restaurant for lunch. And, you know, um, unusually he was, you know, uh, with so much e enthusiasm. He said, I, you know, I just wrote actually a blog entry this morning. He said, I loved it. He said, I, I loved it. And unfortunately, I didn't uh, read it until after he passed away. It was his last blog entry that it was about all oh, today's topic. So I feel like um, this is a wonderful way to actually continue our communication, conversation with him and you know, honor him. And I'm, I have no doubt that his spirit is here with us today with his enthusiasm and curiosity. So please welcome Dr. Keltner. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Hansuk. Uh, it is always great to be in Ann Arbor, the very heart of psychology and social psychology. Uh, what a terrific honor. It is an honor to, and a privilege to do this talk uh, in the spirit of Chris Peterson. Um, he was a big spirited presence in the field, was always warm and open to younger scholars. Uh, his book, Primer in Positive Psychology was a foundation for the happiness class that I teach at UC Berkeley that ended up going online and, and reaching so many people. And I always very much enjoyed his scholarship and his, his place in the world. So it's, um, it's really a terrific honor and, and very fitting, as Nansuk said, given that his last blog was about awe and he wondered about the science of awe. And, and we have a lot going on at Berkeley and elsewhere. So uh, that's great. And, you know, it's. Coming to Michigan is really like coming to family for me. Um, and I come every 10 years or so when Phoebe calls me and says, you gotta come. You know, I'm like, <laughs> I'll come. You know, uh, even though my whole family's having a nervous breakdown and whatever it is. So, uh, and uh, Rich Gonzalez was my classmate and I would not have made it out of graduate school without Rich Gonzalez, uh, who is the, the wisest, smartest use of statistics I've ever been around and there is no doubt about that, and taught me everything about uh, the quantitative approaches to the field. So much so that we ended up, like all Rich had to do was say sums of squares, and we had a little private joke about that, and, <laughs> uh, and Dick Nisbet, um, you know, I admire so uh, for all that he's done. He still gets more fired up about empirical findings than any human being I know, uh, and has spread that uh, that enthusiasm for our discipline to me in writing the textbook all these years. It's been, I, you know, everybody says textbooks are disasters for careers and no fun and big, you do them begrudgingly. And, and it's been an incredible intellectual delight, which is really incredible. Uh, I live with David Dunning in graduate school. Uh, I actually remember I was thinking about this, David. I won't disclose anything about living with you. So, uh, but my first day at Stanford, I remember David and Dale Griffin were like, blah, 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 algorithm. I'm like, what? hey, I'm studying psychology. What's an algorithm? You know, and David defined algorithm for me and forever changed my life. Um, <laughs> and as I like to reflect, and I'm sorry this is going on so long, but this is a personal thing. Um, uh, I would not be standing right here if it weren't for Phoebe Ellsworth. Uh, I was on my way out of graduate school. Uh, Phoebe rescued my reputation. Uh, and uh, I was really interested in human emotion in 1986, um, and the discipline did not exist, really, except for scattered findings in different parts of the place, uh, the field, and Phoebe uh, got me to do a paper with her that really shaped how I think about emotion. Uh, she got me, she just started handing me these interesting books on emotion, 
uh, that were coming from different disciplines. And so uh, without Phoebe, Rich and I would be baking bread in San Santa Cruz and we'd probably be happier for it, but that's, <laughs> but, uh, but that's neither here nor there. So, uh, and that's how, it, for you younger people in the room, this is what happens if you are lucky enough to have a career for a while is uh, you become very deeply grateful for the people that are on your path. Um, so with all of that, what I'd like to do is talk about this new science of awe um, that we've been taking part, we've been developing at UC Berkeley. Uh, the title was a little bit different. Uh, I'll talk about some of the kind of uh, soft intervention work that we're doing, and that's why I talk about the culture of awe uh, that has to do with these inner city kids that are riding, riding down uh, the South Fork of the American River uh, and what the benefits are. An idea that comes from Michigan, in a way, with uh, the Kaplan's work. Uh, but I want to tell you, um, as Nansuk said, I tend to dive into studying different emotions that I think are part of a suite of 20 emotions that evolution built into our nervous system, worked on, you know, very fitting. Uh, I got my graduate degree, got a postdoc, was embarrassed about my life and studied embarrassment. Uh, <laughs> we had kids and I was blown away by attachment processes and I studied attachment. Uh, and now as I'm aging and I'm facing mortality, I've decided to study awe. So uh, that's, how the, that's how it all unfolds. So, um, so a deep vein in Western thought and uh, in other areas of scholarship as well, uh, and Phoebe and I talked about this, is that, and, and really it's at the heart of our, our early work in the field, is that uh, emotions are, are drivers of the human experience of thought and social interactions. Uh, and you can even push it more specifically, which is that there are claims in different scholarly traditions that, that there are defining emotions of the human character, right, and human morality. So there's a rich tradition uh, with respect to compassion that, as Karen Armstrong, the religious historian, says that compassion is, is at the center, is an organizing principle of ethical contemplative traditions uh, and drives social affairs. Adam Smith made the case that gratitude is kind of this cardinal emotion, as Martha Nussbaum would write, that it really is uh, sort of an organizing principle of thought and behavior and cognition. Uh, and then there are a lot of people who make the case that awe, the feeling of being in the presence of things that are vast, that you don't understand, is a defining human experience. Protagoras in his myth uh, from Greek thought uh, made the case that God, when we're designing all the species, uh, looked at humans, and we were kind of one of the last species to be designed in this origin myth, and we weren't that fast, and we weren't that muscular, we don't have the large canines uh, and the like, but we needed something that really set us apart from other species, and he made the case that it was awe. Um, interestingly, uh, as I just read this fascinating book by a philosopher, um, as people started to, as uh, Newton and Rene Descartes and other early philosophers started to figure out how we perceive rainbows, uh, Descartes came to the belief through his early geometric calculations and the experience that it was awe and wonder that drove scientific discovery. And I think when you look at scientists, uh, you would certainly make the case that that's true. Um, the early thinking about awe, of course, 2,500 years ago is religious uh, and conversion stories um, like Paul, uh, conversion stories in, uh, in Hinduism kind of center upon the, the, pr the sort of prominence of this transcendent awe experience that leads you to change your life. Uh, and there are a lot of writings, as John Knight and I discovered, about the centrality of awe in religion. Um, really interesting intellectual developments and all emotions, and this is underappreciated except by historians, emotions evolve through history. Right? And awe starts out as a religious emotion in the written record. At the end of today, I'll talk about how I think awe uh, religion builds upon other awe-related processes. Um, and uh, it's just this fascinating development in the history of awe, which is it becomes secularized and democratized. So, uh, and a very unlikely source of this all is Edmund Burke, who writes, people are really interested in the Age of Enlightenment about the distinction between um, awe and beauty. What is the difference between seeing a beautiful field of flowers and then an awe-inspiring vista or something that you see in Yosemite? Burke takes it on pre before Immanuel Kant 
And what he does is he, he secularizes awe. And I don't think he intended to do it, but he writes this amazing analysis of how we feel awe about things that are powerful and obscure. And you feel awe at certain times of the day. And you feel awe when, or the sublime in that era's language, when you see patterns of shadows, right, which you probably have had the experience. Uh, contrasts, uh, and when I talk to Phoebe, I'm like, what's the most awe-inspiring time to come to Ann Arbor? And she's like, right around Halloween, so here I am. Because there are all these contrasts in colors and leaves that trigger the feeling of awe. Uh, and does this amazing uh, analysis that really changes our culture's experience and appreciation of awe. Here's this interesting uh, speculation. Certain sensory modalities produce awe. Visual, audition, a little bit less so. He was convinced olfaction, you can never have awe in smelling things. Anybody believe that? I don't believe that. So, uh, you know, just smell. You know, there's new research on the fragrance that a baby's head releases. You know, it's like, mmm, you know, you need to get into it. And, um, and then for the US culture, uh, the big, big development is Ralph Waldo Emerson. And again, historically, Emerson is, got into these fights with the church at Harvard, uh, who are very dogmatic and structured, and pulled awe out of dogmatic structures into individual experiences, transcendentalism. And I'll read a quote of Emerson in just a second, but for him, uh, it was all about nature. And that will become, that's an interesting theme, very obvious theme, but much more powerful uh, than you might imagine. So, that's all fine and good. Those are philosophers waving their arms and doing what they do. Um, and over time, um, this is how I approach the emotions, and, and I think these are kind of meta-theoretical notions that will guide a bunch of studies that we do. Uh, and so, um, but they, they really have guided how um, our lab and other labs like Jess Tracy and a lot of other investigators now think about the distinct emotions rather than just emotions as a broader category. Um, one is I take a functional approach to emotions, that they solve problems for people in cultures or within an evolutionary context. This idea began with Phoebe, where we were grappling with the idea of how specific emotions will structure very important cognitive processes like attributional processes or estimates of risk or causality. Um, and so we're gonna, I'm just going to show you some data. I think awe, if compassion protects vulnerable things, um, as one example of a functional claim, I think awe is the quintessential collective emotion that solves a fundamental problem for us, which is shifting from individual self to collective identity. Shinobu's been thinking about this for a long time. Awe does a lot of that work. Um, I work in a tradition uh, that really is interested in the question of universality, that we are, we have a, a shared evolution, 200,000 years in small groups, uh, and, and that there will be certain commonalities that are very important to this emotion. Uh, we've gathered tons of data, uh, to actually we have narrative data from, in part, thanks to Shinobu's assistance, from 25 cultures. We've been doing, studying on China and Japan, Spain and the like, and there are really interesting themes I'll talk about at the end about cultural variations, um, but uh, I'll talk about universality. And then I do believe, and I think the data are increasingly showing, that these emotions really are engaging genetically based physiological systems. Um, and uh, as the statistical techniques become more sophisticated, Rich would have known this right away, uh, the field is starting to figure out how to analyze big patterns of data that start to show specificity. Uh, and what's fascinating about awe, is, and I'll talk about some physiological findings, is, uh, uh, and it's still a bit of a mystery, is there's this fascinating physiological response. It seems to track awe and no other state. Goosebumps, right? Uh, you may think that you, you have goosebumps when you listen to opera and the woman sings and you, know, you think it's this uniquely human thing. Actually, we're right there with rats have piloerection, dogs have piloerection. It's a very common mammalian process that will tell us about the deep evolution of all. Okay, so just to orient us, being in the presence of vast things uh, that transcend our understanding, one of the really amazing things that we grappled early with respect to awe 
is it comes from many sources. Uh, and people and cultures have their own awe profile, which we're starting to discover. So you can have awe when you're in the Saint-Chapelle in Paris and the beautiful stained glass. You can have awe when you read the great intellectual figures, right? Your advisor, Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, for Berkeley people, it drives me nuts. Um, they go to the restaurant Chez Panisse and they talk about the leek soup and they start weeping and is, act as if it's a spiritual experience. And I'm like, what a bunch of class BS or whatever it is. So, uh, politics give us awe. The most awe-inspiring moment for me at Berkeley's campus is our free speech uh, movement, 1964, which comes out of the, the earlier activism of African Americans in the South. Uh, you can go to religious temples like Tiger's Nest in Bhutan or Chichen Itza. Uh, and today's a very important day, I think. This is my most awe-inspiring figure. That is indeed an Ann Arbor native. Who, anybody know who that is? That's Iggy Pop, who grew up here. And today just so happens to be the release of Jim Jarmus's documentary of Iggy in his early years. Definite source of awe for many people. Okay. <laughs> now, psychologists like, th this is kind of the, the I'm going to move through. We got a lot of data on this whole process that awe produces these core appraisals. This is an idea that Phoebe and I started to work on, that these appraisals dot drive more specific processes related to emotion, like being curious or sacrificing for the group or engaging in pro-social tendencies, which all help you fold into social collectives. This is just sort of a, a flow chart to help us. All right, so let me show you a variety of studies, experiments, um, that start to tell us how awe, more so than really closely related emotions like amusement or pride or other positive states, kind of awakens the mind to orient to the collective and to fold into social collectives. Um, and that's a great painting uh, by Alex Gray, who's very interested in awe. Um, this idea that awe has these radical shifts to human cognition and our connection to social communities is evident everywhere in the early writings about awe, um, religious writings, other kinds of writings. This is, uh, this just stunned me as I, I started this work. This is Ralph Waldo Emerson, whom I've already cited, um, writing about his experience in nature and in the woods. And he says, in the woods, we return to reason and faith. There, I feel that nothing can befall me in life, no disgrace, no calamity, that nature cannot repair. I think that's a stunning idea, that every problem in social living is repaired by nature, by walking in redwood trees or an arboretum here in Ann Arbor. Uh, that po points to really interesting psychological processes. Standing on the bare ground, my head by, bathed by the blithe air and uplifted into infinite space, all mean egotism vanishes. Again, a fascinating property of awe, which is all the egotistical, self-interested tendencies are quieted in the service of something else. So let me show you a few studies that sort of only dimly capture uh, this idea. Uh, by the way, you know, um, John Muir, who helped found the Sierra Club, of course, as you know, uh, and our national parks, um, has just spectacular writings from his first summer in the Sierras that are about the power of awe and shifting thought and social behavior. I love this, this quote um, where, you know, it's starting to sound a little bit like John Lennon of the Beatles, we are now, or George, George Harrison, really, more fittingly. We are now in the mountains, and they are in us, kindling enthusiasm, making every nerve quiver filling every pore and cell of us. Our flesh and bone tabernacle, the, the individual identity, uh, seems transparent to the glass of the beauty around us. It's like all the boundaries of self and other start to fade away in experiences of awe. All right, so let me show you some studies. Um, this is Lonnie Shiota, very early in this game. We took Berkeley undergrads. Uh, we had them stand next to this replica of a T-Rex, which you know, a reviewer is like, how do you know that's awe-inspiring? So we gathered pilot data. Undergrad said it was awe-inspiring. <laughs> uh, and those are my daughters when they used to feel awe toward me. Uh, now it's, it's social disgust and other interesting emotions. And we, they just stood there, and they, they, we had them sort of do something that uh, Shinobu's done. We said the 20 statements task, I am X and Y. They fill in the blanks. Or they stand in the same place, uh, but they're looking down a hallway. 
Uh, and, and what you find is we coded these, they're much more likely to mention uh, common humanity qualities as part of their identity, just standing next to this T-Rex skeleton, right? Things like, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm a, a human being, I'm a Berkeley undergrad, I'm made of DNA, I'm all living beings, you know, I'm a mammal. Uh, they sort of focus on their collective identity. Um, Paul Piff took undergrads uh, in a recent paper, JPSP, and we have this incredible stand of uh, eucalyptus trees in Berkeley. They're the tallest eucalyptus trees in North America. Uh, and they either looked up into the trees for about a minute. This doesn't do it. Uh, eucalyptus are amazing because they reflect light and they have fragrances. The Berkeley High students are right over here getting high, so that may have contaminated our results, but <laughs> we controlled for that. Uh, hopefully not my daughters. Uh, and they look up in the trees for a minute or they look up at a science building. <laughs> They're standing in the same place, but they turn around and what you find is you know, the flesh and bone tabernacle that Muir wrote, writes about starts to disappear. They feel less self-important after a couple of minutes looking up into the trees. They feel less entitled. They, they actually need less money for the experiment. We're like, hey man, here's some money for the study. They're like, I don't need it. I'm, I'm going to sell my, I'm giving away everything. And <laughs> they're tracking around the world. Uh, and we staged a little accident like social psychologists are wont to do. And they picked up more pens of a poor guy who fell. Uh, feeling awe. And we've replicated this awe to altruism finding in national samples, kids, uh, in many different places. Um, Jenny Steller out at, uh, at um, Toronto now has done a lot of neat studies. She, just getting people again, we take them to the top of the Campanile Tower, which has this awesome view, or they kind of have this sort of calm, pleasing view. It's sort of a pleasant place. Uh, and they feel vast right here, uh, and then they self-report more humility compared to this nice, pleasant control condition. So we're starting to see a smaller self. Uh, Yang Bai has done amazing work in China. Um, a variety of different studies really characterizing what she calls the small self, which is this sense of a smaller identity where you still have positive self-esteem and you really just feel like you're part of something big, right? You're no longer taking up all the kind of psychological space of that. This is from a diary study, uh, and, and uh, Shinobu is going to love this one. So this is, we gathered people's experiences of awe over the two, a two-week period, um, and uh, we, we sort of find out what they're experiencing awe from, and this is China and the U.S., you will note there's most of the time we feel awe around other people and nature. There's one striking difference, cultural difference that stands out. Americans are more likely to be awestruck by themselves. <laughs> Nine percent of their awe experiencers are like, man, I was, did you see that skateboard move I just did? I am awestruck, you know. <laughs> and the Chinese are like, that is epistemologically impossible. So, <laughs> and we've replicated that a bunch of times. So. Uh, God knows why that happens. Uh, and what we find every day we measure their sense of uh, how big their self is compared to joy. And, and in both cultures, awe tends to really diminish the sense of self size and small self. Uh, Yang, again inspired by some of Shinobu's work, uh, actually, it, uh, believe it or not, went to Yosemite and got 1,400 people from around the world to fill out questionnaires right when they see this view. It's very awe-inspiring. Rich, have you been there? Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Uh, but, or she surveyed them at Fisherman's Wharf, a very pleasurable place, and she just said, hey, draw yourself, right? And this is what you look like at Fisherman's Wharf. You're in love. Uh, little do they know what's coming when they get married. Uh, and, and the self is very big, and this was, I'm not kidding, a randomly selected drawing from Yosemite, uh, and there's the self right there. The self becomes very small. So awe really starts to diminish the self uh, in, in this. A um, lot of neat new data. Uh, these are just some snippets. Happy to take on Q&A about how awe really radically shifts self-orientation and a lot of the processes that move away from individual self to the interdependent collective self. All right, so let me tell you a brief story about universality of awe signaling. 
Um, and uh, as Nansuk said, it's been a defining interest in my career to start to map the signals of emotion in this Darwinian tradition. Um, and it, you know, moving way beyond the Ekman 6, we've done a lot of work on different displays. Uh, we have a lot of work of different modalities like tactile contact, which is dramatically underappreciated in our field, um, even though it's really the fundamental system that by which um, infants attach to parents, right? It's the first sensory modality that's really cranking and online. Uh, there's a lot of new work in Switzerland on scent and the emotional connotations. Steve Palmer in my department has done a lot of really amazing work on the universal emotion signaling properties of color. Um, it's much richer than what we used to think. And I have been obsessed with human voice uh, as a way to communicate emotion for interesting reasons I'll tell you about. Um, those are some of the facial displays. So when we started to walk upright um, compared to our primate relatives, one of the fundamental shifts is it led to a kind of a reorganization of our vocal apparatus. And vocalization became independent of breathing. Our primate relatives moving around on all fours, their vocalizations are much more constrained because it's tied to breathing. And so they have a more narrow bandwidth of the emotions they signal through uh, the voice. And humans, that, that became freed up. And we have this incredible apparatus by which air particles hit the vocal folds or cords, move through your mouth, turn into sound waves, and then depending on all sorts of factors, come out of the mouth in this very sophisticated system of communication. Uh, it really, I, I, we are starting to gather data uh, showing it's much richer uh, than the face uh, in terms of emotional signaling and underappreciated. I know Shinobu's done cool work on culture and voice. Um, not only that, um, the, their, Klaus Schera started writing about um, these things called vocal bursts, which are sounds by which we communicate emotion um, in, in a quarter of a second. What's interesting for those of you who are interested in evolution is these sounds are much older than the written language and spoken language, right? They are millions of years old. Our spoken and written language is earlier or more recent in evolution. Primate species have about five emotional vocal signals. Uh, and so it's this amazing opportunity to look at the deep evolution of an emotion, because these are very old sounds in the vocal repertoire, vocal bursts. So I'm going to test you guys. Um, Here's a vocal burst that I hear from my teenage daughters. See if you know what emotion this is. You guys ready? <laughs> what emotion is that? Man, this is a sharp crowd, right? I mean, I do that sound to people from all over the world, Hong Kong government officials. They know immediately, like, don't let your daughter speak like that, you know, or, you know. And it is contempt, right? All right, now I'm going to test you guys. I'm going to count to three. And I want to give you to give me your best sympathy sound. One, two, three. There we go. <laughs> this department's getting along, you know. <laughs> this is no joke. I did this recently at Goldman Sachs. I was there for some reason to speak. I'm like, okay, best sympathy sound. One, two, three. By the way, I did it at San Quentin Prison where I go regularly. They nailed it. I go to Goldman Sachs, one, two, three, silence. <laughs> I'm like, all right, back up, entertain me, just give your best shot. One, two, three, and I heard sounds like, ah, ah, ah. And I was like, forget it. Thank you for screwing up our economy. So, um, so uh, this is amazing. So Dan Cordero, unbeknownst to me, a grad student in my lab, now living in Bali, um, <laughs> he went to, he got data from 10 radically different cult cultures. He play played these vocal bursts to people, sympathy, desire, surprise, contempt, uh, another kind of desire, anger, pain, triumph, awe. And you see, with just the best methodologies of judging emotion, awe, people are judging awe displays, oh, right, uh, about 90% of the time. Uh, Dan, I had gone to Bhutan and set up some uh, contacts 
many years ago. Bhutan, there are not that many remote cultures left in the world, as you've probably been hearing, five or six. Um, and Bhutan happened, or at least a few years ago, had remote cultures. It was a, you couldn't get there uh, in the 80s and 90s. It is extremely hard to travel around Bhutan because it's in the Himalayas. And there were remote villages that Dan managed to find in eastern Bhutan. There's only one place in Bhutan where you can land a plane. And I tell you, it's an adventure. Uh, and so Dan found this um, village. He ran this vocal burst study. That's when I went with my friend Leaf, my good friend Leaf, when we went to Bhutan. This is kind of what the village looked like, uh, very remote ge geographically. And what you find, uh, chance guessing in his particular paradigm was down here. Lots of signals are way above chance. Awe does very well as a, they can hear our sounds of awe and readily pick it up. Uh, we've recently, this is, uh, I'm going to talk to Phoebe about this a little bit later. This is really cool stuff. Uh, if you can hire a young guy named Alan Cohen, I would. He's like Rich. He's a genius in mathematics. He knows how to represent the space of things better than anybody I've seen with new mathematical techniques. He gathered data on 1,500 vocal bursts, does some, gather some data, and then maps them into space. And you can see there are these clusters of emotion signals. These are all vocal bursts. Uh, that are really interesting how anger mixes in with pain and disgust. But awe signals, and you see our awe signals tend to cluster distinctly from closely related ones like confusion and interest. But this is what's amazing, is these signals all reflect kind of an epistemological orientation about understanding in the world. So the, the acoustic similarity of these signals maps onto their semantic purpose. And just to, so confusion sounds like, huh? Interest sounds like, oh. Realization is like, oh. And awe is like, oh. <laughs> and that's all there in this cool judgment data. Uh, and so there we go. Um, this work led to this crazy project uh, uh, at, at, uh, where I was asked, I worked down at Facebook, to redesign their emoticons, uh, which led to reactions. And I gave uh, a Pixar artist, when I was working on Inside Out, uh, I said, hey, just draw a bunch of emotions with emoticons. This guy's a genius, by the way. Uh, like, look at admiration. Look how subtle that smile is. This is what graduate students are supposed to do when they talk to Phoebe Ellsworth. They're like, yeah, <laughs> right? And then astonish, ooh, you know. Uh, devotion has this different thing. So we, we did a bunch of data collection on these. We then, by the way, so here they are. Here's the awe one. You can fax code these, which, I, which was really fun. So these are anatomical facial muscle movements. These led to uh, the creation of a sticker pack at, at Facebook, which are the little emojis that people send around, called Finch. Why is it named Finch? Tar Charles Darwin. It was in honor of Charles Darwin. Uh, here is the awe expression. But look how wonderful these are. Like, oh, there's a sympathy one. I, you know, I devoted my career rather you know, purposely to embarrassment. So there it is, uh, love and so forth. Uh, this is the classic academic expression right here. Mm. <laughs> or this one right here. Uh, and what we're allowed to do is map out hundreds of millions, now billions of these have been sent. We captured some big data. And this Shinobu, this is a new way to represent the emotional profile of a culture. See if you're convinced. So here are cultures, the redder, the color, the uh, more the, um, they send these emotions as a proportion of their, emotion, their emoticon sent. So here are cultures of love, uh, lower colors. Uh, I love this one. Cultures of sympathy. Who sends a lot of sympathy displays around the world? Look at that Canada-US divide. <laughs> you, you cross over into Canada, and they're just sending a bunch of sympathy displays. Uh, here's anger. And as Donald Trump campaigns around the world, you know it's just flaring up all kinds of angry displays. Uh, and then here's awe. And actually, you know, it's interesting. We have mapped at the nation level, awe predicts how much charitable giving people engage in, uh, in, in terms of these emoticon uses, which is really. We also have this really cool finding. The higher uh, the Gini coefficient, the greater the inequality, the more negative uh, emoticons that our people are sending on the national level. So just, just sort of fun and games coming out of this, this science. OK, third point, and then I will um, tell you about
kind of the, the soft intervention work we're doing, and then some of the big questions that um, I'm thinking about, or our lab is thinking about and bumping into uh, in this field. So the, there are a couple of really interesting um, things to think about with respect to the neurophysiology of awe. And there will be fMRI studies with new you know, decoding techniques that will probably find specific regions of uh, the brain that are activated during awe experiences. Mario Beauregard has worked a little on this. There's, it's a very vibrant question right now in uh, England where there's a young scholar interested in psychedelic experiences, very obvious source of awe, which tends to quiet the default network, which is interesting. Um, but I know that literature will develop. Uh, inspired by Shinobu's work on this kind of culture uh, genetic polymorphism. We, Craig Anderson, have now replicated in three different samples with teenagers uh, and adults and with Shinobu's assistance, we're gathering data in different cultures. We have an amazing data set um, with uh, people from four different cultures who immigrated to Spain, Morocco, Pakistan, Ecuador, and Romania. Um, looking at this kind of culture openness gene, how it relates to awe, it's very obvious that awe drives cultural interest and cultural change. And we find in three different data sets that this, this one variation that Shinobu studied predicts increased awe in response to stimuli and not other positive emotions like pride or amusement. It's very specific. But the one that's really interesting to me is piloerection. And we, you know, we had, Belinda Campos had an early finding uh, kind of free narrative data, uh, when we feel awe, you know, when I saw Nelson Mandela come out of prison, and I, I was one of 55,000 people in Oakland that went to his, uh, his talk, I, I was one giant goosebump, right? I was just like, uh, and, and that is a mammalian response of piloerection. Um, mammals will have muscle contractions around their hair follicles that fluffs up their fur, that tends to make them look big in the face of threat and tends to unite other conspecifics in the face of threat. Very interesting, rats very commonly piloerect, our precursor to goosebumps, when they face threatening things to get other rats to help them out, right? It's this binding collective response down to the mammalian uh, our, our mammalian relatives like rats. So we gathered data from 25 cultures to starting to show the universality of that uh, mapping. Um, as a segue to the intervention work, um, I know some of you are interested, uh, Shinobu is interested in the inflammation response. Um, as you know, a wing of our immune system, the cytokine system, attacks things in our bodies that are dangerous. You swell up. Uh, you have mucus, it's as if you have a flu to rid yourself of uh, pathogens. Uh, there are little cytokines, these are cytokines in your cells that are attacking a pathogen. Um, as you've probably been hearing, the inflammation response is a pathway to depression, uh, diabetes, certain kinds of autoimmune diseases, cardiovascular diseases. Greg Miller and Edith Chen at Northwestern are finding poverty jacks up the cytokine system uh, so that by the time you're five, it's hyperactivated. And it shaves six years of life expectancy off what you, how much time you get. Um, Jenny Steller, in a recent paper, found that only awe of the positive emotions quiets the cytokine response. Getting out of the self into the sense of community and collectivity drops down the cytokine response. Really exciting possibilities there. So, final set of, of data, and, and then I'll tell you some of the bigger questions we're grappling with. Um, so, um, I, how many of you have gotten out in nature, and then when you come back you feel like you're stronger physically? Right? I mean that, how many of you, have gone out in nature and like your, the issues that were bothering you no longer seem relevant. I mean, to me that's stunning. Like you go out in the woods in, in California, you see the redwood tree and you're like, 
you know that rejection letter? I understand their point of view now. <laughs> you know, and actually my mom's kind of a reasonable person, even though her conspiracy <laughs> theories drive me nuts and I'm tired of hearing about Noam Chomsky. And you know, that will tell you about my mom. Um, I, I love Noam Chomsky, but you know, enough. No, sorry. Um, uh, and so that, I, I, I mean, I think that's ca the Kaplans here at Michigan, Francis Quo, really a pioneer in this work uh, at the University of Illinois Chicago. Um, we're starting to show how green spaces make us feel stronger and uh, uh, do better. So I got approached by um, one of the most remarkable people I've ever met, who's Stacy Bear, who, uh, six foot eight, giant beard, uh, was a veteran, um, did all the tough stuff, and uh, came back to the United States, was a cocaine addict, uh, other drugs, suicidal, had a gun to his head, and his friend said, you're either gonna kill yourself or you're gonna come rock climbing with me. And so they went rock climbing in Utah, and it changed his life, that experience, right? Just like the grandeur and the awe and the recalibration of his psyche. Uh, and now he runs outdoors programs for veterans and inner city kids through the Sierra Club approached our lab, and we started with, I, I cited the, the Great Outdoors Lab. Just, to, just so you get a sense of this guy, his, what he's doing now, and you're welcome to join him, is he's going back to all the places that he fought battles in and doing outdoors activities. So you can join him on a trip to Kabul and Afghanistan if you want, because he's going to go rock climbing there. He's going to need a lot of support, so, which he'll have. I mean, it's, he's an incredible human being. So what we do, um, is for the past couple summers, based on this science, uh, this, is, this is the most weird science I've ever done. Uh, and I've done some weird things. So we recruit inner city kids from Oakland and Richmond. Sadly, in California, uh, we have some very tough places. Um, not tough, I should say, under-resourced. Um, and a lot of these kids have never camped. Uh, they've never seen a sky full of stars. They've never had the chance to get outdoors. So we take them on these rafting trips. Uh, and then we've also, the actual, the, actually we have a larger number now, we've taken about 40 veterans, 50 veterans. Uh, and that's a whole interesting, love to take that up in the Q&A. Our veterans, 2.5 million, are being profoundly disserved, as you know. To a veteran, I've talked to a lot of them. Mainly, they're given pharmaceuticals, and they hate it. They're young people who want to get out. They want to do challenging stuff. That's what they're here to do. So we take um, inner city kids, and they go down these wild rapids in, uh, on the South Fork of the American River. Um, and you know, boats capsize. Uh, we have footage in one where the trip leader uh, is back here. And the footage shows like they go into this clump of trees, and the tree knocks the trip leader off the raft into the river. And the teenagers are like, right on, let's go. You know, so, uh, and uh, what we do is we gather saliva before and after. And we're going to be looking at cortisol. We've got some cool cortisol findings. Uh, we gather diary data on the uh, trip. We got a lot of self-follow-up, self-report data. Uh, GoPro, when they heard about this, volunteered a bunch of GoPro cameras, which we now have a lot of video footage. Uh, we have this great finding where the more people scream in unison on the trip, because it is scary, uh, their cortisol levels converge by the end of the trip. By the end of the trip, if they're all screaming, they're like, they all have the same levels of stress hormone. Um, but um, here's what we find with teenagers before, one week later, and we're going to be looking at control conditions and mediation pathways, they're feeling less stressed. These are very, these are very at-risk kids. Uh, their social well-being goes up. They're more satisfied with life. Uh, with the veterans, um, you see a 30% drop in PTSD symptoms, which is very hard to find anything that moves that profile around. Uh, so we're doing a lot of follow-up on that. So uh, Nansuk said I could go till like 2.05. Uh, or so. So let me um, just tell you what we're thinking about. Um, the 
first thing that's really interesting uh, and surprise, this may not surprise you, but it's, it surprised me. Um, I had thought, being a Western European, that all would be, you know, cathedrals and uh, amazing music and, and then the religious people have their religious awe. Uh, and that's the kind of where it all, uh, that's its heart and its essence. And that's wrong. Um, awe, uh, from, we've surveyed 25 countries uh, from, you know, Indonesia to parts of South America representing most of the continents. And most of people's experiences of awe comes from social stuff and nature, right? And it's interesting, it really comes from magnanimity, that we are blown away by other people's generosity. Around the world, any woman would tell you this, and only a numbskull man scientist, a lot of it's birth, birth stories, right? Just like, and I remember my first daughter's birth was awe-inspiring. Awe is, I think the, the origins are social and natural patterns, very fitting with biophilia and the Kaplan's work. Um, when Paul Piff went to study the Himba in, um, in remote Namibia with a team uh, a couple summers ago, mainly what they talked about in sort of awe, th this is a, a culture that doesn't really have a religion, not a written record, very little artistic tradition. Uh, it's all social in nature, right? So that is really interesting to me, just thinking about the deep evolutionary story. It begins in these small group processes and then is probably co-opted by religion. Um, second thing that's really interesting is, and this is, you know, Shinobu and I have talked a bit about all. Uh, we've done this work in China, which is the analyses are much more well developed, and Japan uh, with Shinobu, is I, there's a vertical law and there's a horizontal law. Uh, and Western European awe is horizontal for the most part. It's where you're merging with people on a plane, and then there's more uh, vertical awe, right? And our data from China suggest awe, you look up, it, you feel judged, you feel constrained, you feel small in a different way. So I think that's going to be a big theme, and it's interesting, uh, in fact, a couple of Michigan scholars in the archaeology of inequality in more egalitarian cultures, our hunter-gatherer uh, period, it, experiences were more communal. Religion turns things into hierarchies, and I think we're going to see that be a big distinction, cultural distinction, religious distinction, in the study of awe. Um, and that really is where uh, we're thinking as well, which is there are interesting tensions between nature-based awe and religious awe. There's this fascinating paper, big data paper, showing where you have a lot of natural beauty, you have less religion. And where you have less natural beauty, you have more religion, right? There's this interesting psychological tension about where we get the deep meaning. Uh, and I think that's going to have very interesting implications we can study with respect to uh, how open we are, inquiry, uh, and there will probably be a couple of varieties of awe as well. Um, the, I just want to, Nansuk mentioned the Greater Good Science Center, which is all free. Uh, this, so if you're interested in this and other themes in this space, the, really the Chris Peterson space, of the good, the sort of kind stuff in human nature. Uh, we've got five million people who are reading our website. We have a bunch of practices you can put into practice, so lots of good stuff. So, uh, and with that, I will say thank you and look forward to your, your own ideas about all. So thanks a lot. So this was great. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to hear a little more about the differences between awe brought about by the vastness of, say, the Himalayan mountains yeah. or the sort of awe that I get when I'm listening to music or yeah. when I'm eating amazing food or listening to a great talk. So, yeah. uh, Maybe those distinctions. Yeah, you know, that question is so far ahead of the science. Um, the, 
And, and I think what's going to happen is, um, you know, we very, I think we, early in, in the writing about awe, John Haidt and I wrote a paper in 2003. There were only a few scientific publications on awe at the time, kind of a neglected topic. Um, this vastness idea was, I, you know, I was very nature-oriented, and it felt physical. It felt like size, big redwood trees, vistas, as you suggested. Uh, but as I've learned more about awe, and talk to people like uh, former conductors, right? Or, or thought about intellectual awe or epistemological awe. I think we're gonna have to reconceptualize that dimension of size, right? So there can be a temporal uh, dimension to, va to vastness where an experience uh, can link into a lot of experiences in your life. And I think, you know, it's interesting, in our 25 cultures, um, older people have more awe than younger, than middle-aged people. And rich, we have hope still. So we're in the middle of life. And, and I think there's a temporal dis dimension to their experience. Uh, this conductor told me that this central, central process that drives awe in music is, is this weird mixture of space and time, where sound kind of gets you out of your usual narrow temporal focus and broadens out that sense of vastness. And then intellectual vastness is where you know, and that, I hope you're having that in grad school, right? It's like, God, there's this one idea that links to everything. And when I encountered evolutionary theory, you know, uh, I was suddenly like, oh my God, this, all of this, these data can start to fit together. So that's a, a, a vastness of semantic associations. But no one's done any research on that, so it's all speculative. But great question. There he is. I will not answer sums of squares, Rich. So, <laughs> so great talk, Decker. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to help you give me some intuition about the definition of awe. I yeah. resonate very much to the way you talk about it. Yeah. And it's sort of my intuition. Yeah. But other people I've read talk about awe as a mixed emotion that yeah. includes some negative things like fear and dread. And you did have a slide, or that one, fear and communal awe. Man, so you're already you, anticipating. Can you tell me a little bit more about kind of yeah. how think about the way you talk about it versus this mixed emotion idea? Yeah, yeah. I don't think it's a mixed emotion. Um, thank and thank you for asking that. Uh, so, the the early conceptualizations of awe historically were it kind of was fearful, um, and it's a, a a variant of fear and it has dread and horror in it. Um, and so, how John Haidt and I thought about it is that vastness and reorienting your knowledge structures are the core, the sort of what Phoebe wrote about earlier, like the central appraisals to this emotion. And then what we wrote about, and I'll talk about some data uh, that really address your question. Um, so those are our kind of the prototypical experiences of awe have these two components in it, like you're in a cathedral, it's big and changes your thinking about beauty. And then what I think happens is you add other appraisals into that experience, and you can get variants within this category or family of experiences, right? So you, most importantly, you can add threat, um, and, and that awe experience will become a fearful form of awe. We're about to publish a paper showing it's about 25% of people's experiences of awe are fear-based or threat-based. It's so interesting. Um, and, and it came as a surprise. I don't have fear-based awe as a general tendency. I have a lot of other fears. But, you know, like we started showing images of space to people, like imagine you're a little dot in space and this is your universe and, you know, and here's, you know. And I was like, this is so amazing and awe-inspiring. A quarter of our people freaked out. They had panic attacks, like, oh, you know. Uh, and so very seriously, the threat dimension is only in about a quarter of awe experiences if you just sample it. Uh, and it changes the physiology of awe in our paper with Amy Gordon. It changes the effects upon thought patterns, right? It changes the experience. Um, so I think that's way to, one way to handle that question. And I do think awe is pure. And then this, this is why I'm so excited about Alan Cowan's findings, which is this, um, which is, uh, Rich probably already picked this up, but it, first of all, all those vocalizations, these are dozens of vocalizations cluster into a space, 
And they're in this epistemological space about understanding the world, right? If you, if you grant that. And then fear vocalizations, ah, they're over here, right? They're in a different part of this semantic space of 1,500 sounds. And I think we've replicated that with facial behavior. So there are a lot of data that start to make the case that this, that was, that fear-based conceptualization was an early religious conceptualization of awe, which was only a, one historical moment. So a lot of ways to take on that very important question. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Aaron. This is great. Uh, I, I'm curious how you might interpret DRD4 finding, that is, this link between 7-2, yeah. repeat allele, yeah. and all. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that uh, as it relates to, I mean, you know better than me, uh, elevated dopamine and dopamine in uh, Jacques Panksepp's model of emotion is about exploration, right? And that's where I got my thinking about this. And so this is an exploratory state uh, enabled by dopamine levels in DRD4. Uh, and, and awe at its core is about exploration, and then your work sort of converges on that thinking. Yeah. What do you think? Well, I, awe itself is all psychical and very complex. Yeah. So, um, well, I, I'm very curious. Uh, you, you know, I, I think DRD4 is linked to dopamine reward processing, and at some level. Yeah. But at the same time, if you expand this reward processing thing too much, that becomes kind of humorous. Yeah, right? yeah. So uh, that's where this whole conception of all yeah. seems to be inconsistent. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm curious how, uh, you know, obviously you don't have a clear answer to a too preliminary, all we need is more data. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, but it's very interesting. So there must be some balancing act somewhere in the brain and interaction with the environment to create this very complex emotion, which is in part motivated by reward seeking. Yeah. At the very initial phase of yeah. emotion. Yeah. But, but then somehow there needs to be under regulation of this egoism in some way uh, to yeah. create this, uh, you know, uh, this much broader meaning yeah. of which self yeah. uh, is only a small part. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with your analysis, although I think you know, there's a tendency, it's interesting in the field, uh, you know, like our study of compassion, everybody thinks compassion is a really complex emotion um, it, from one theoretical perspective, but it's actually very simple, right? And mammals show it. The, we did an fMRI study where uh, an old region near the brain stem, the periaqueductal gray, is activated with compassion, and so it's a simpler emotion than we often give it credit for. And I think in some ways, awe may be the same. Like kids, young kids, have a lot of awe, right? So it, it, it probably arises developmentally earlier uh, than a lot of the other emotions, and we, we interpret it in this complex fashion. So I think it's this knowledge-driving emotion um, uh, about collective things. Uh, and I think if we had a richer, Understanding of the kind of rewards that dopamine in, well, engages. It's possible that it's something like all uh, as a package. It yeah. Evolutionarily uh, ingrained in some way, so that <laughs> this emotion could be, uh, you know, mediator of our cultural effect. Yeah, uh, I agree. Yeah. Uh, probably that's what you argue. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, Thank I, you. I'm not hundred yeah. percent sure, but that's yeah, but, but I am. Uh, that, that's a I'm sure of what you said. Yeah. My argument was. Right. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and. Yeah, and I think, well, I think awe, we have a, preliminary data, awe drives a lot of interest in multiculturalism, new music, you know, all the great cultural forms are, you could say, are more proximally driven by experiences of awe. So, hi. So, hey. I'm wondering, as I'm listening to you talking, I'm thinking, how much does novelty play yeah. a role in yeah. this? Because, you know, if you live near a beach, I mean, that's an awe-inspiring for people who don't live near it, but on an everyday basis, it's about the same unless the waves are really high, right? Or there's a whale breaching out, yeah. out yeah. there. If you live in the Swiss Alps, yeah. it's like, okay, I see them every day. Right. But if, the, if there's a sun 
set or something amazing behind it yeah. and it suddenly like that so yeah. and it's here interest is in the a similar yeah. cluster yeah so in other words it's something that's novel in a situation that's unique that is drawing your attention yeah 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 and you know i've this is um the you're right because a lot of these um, states have to do with how your knowledge structures can't make sense of this new thing in front of you. It's not readily classified or made sense of. Um, and I think that novelty is embedded in what we call accommodation, which is a process that begins with novelty. Like, wow, my knowledge can't make sense of what a rainbow is, and then I gotta figure things out. Awe drives that experience, and then I reshape my knowledge structures. But very little studies of that. But I think that novelty is fundamental. Although it is interesting that the most fundamental emotion related to novelty, surprise, it's close to awe, but sort of occupies its own space in that vocal territory. But I think novelty is critical. Uh, okay. I just had a quick question. I don't, I'm not really familiar with your research too much, but I was wondering um, if you guys have ever thought about doing research just kind of like when it comes to video games of some sorts, like <laughs> whether the awe might be different like in terms of like a computer generated like yeah. scenery or that sort of thing, maybe even versus like a first person game versus like a third person version game. And then also like the idea of, this is kind of like a secondary question too, like whether awe can be like shown, like if there's differences when it comes to like a season. So you see a scene yeah. during like a summertime versus a fall versus a winter. Just uh, any yeah. questions or comments on that? Yeah, we, we are studying the effects of seasons, which, uh, which is you know, paradoxical because where I live, there no, there's one season, which <laughs> fog, fog and mild growth and drought. So, um, <laughs> and the, um, the, and, and I, what's your hypothesis about seasons? Um, I don't really have one. I uh, just figured you might have anything to okay. say about that. Maybe, um, yeah. I don't know, there might be, Maybe even a little bit less feelings of awe during, or I mean, I guess it depends on where you live or where well, you are. Well, we have really cool findings. Uh, this is Leanne Tambrinke, who's now at the University of Denver, where, you know, this doesn't apply to California. We did this in other parts. But when you see images of winter, which are kind of awe-inspiring and stark, you kind of have this fearful awe that Rich was talking about. You start hoarding stuff, like, it's all going away, you know? And so, <laughs> uh, so we'll see if awe is the mediator, a fearful-based awe is the mediator of that. Uh, I don't know about video games. I've never played one. Uh, except uh, Pong and then, um, not Pac-Man, Asteroids, uh, but, which was developed before you were born. So, but, but the big question right now is virtual reality. And the, uh, down at Facebook at Oculus, they're very interested in the virtual environment. Uh, and it is awe-inspiring and it raises these questions. I don't think they're that interesting scientifically. Like, do you have more awe in the redwoods or in the virtual reality of the redwoods, I'm like, I don't really care, you know, uh, but you probably have less in the virtual environment. But there are a lot of interesting things you can do with virtual reality to trigger awe. Uh, and video games, I think those will, that will be the kind of, you know, more immersive, more interactive, more communal, would predict more awe and probably worth testing. Oh, yeah. um, oh. Oop, sorry. I'm broken for him. Okay. Fire away. <laughs> Um, so I have kind of like a two-part. Okay, it's fine. I have a two-part-ish question. Uh -huh. um, so it seems like awe, uh, based on your talk, is something that really pulls you out of your yourself, like the con constricted, egoic kind of mind that right. all of us naturally have. Yeah. Um, and that seems like it could have huge potential for how you view yourself in the world and how you view others yes. in relation to yourself. Um, and I've definitely like experienced you know, some of the th examples you were saying of, you know, the cosmos and when you look at like maps of like the galaxies and what the speck of whatever that we are in it. Yeah. Um, and for me, it's always like extremely humbling and it really does pull me out of like, oh, I had a stressful week, but you know, in, in general, like it's pretty incredible that we're here right now at all. And that like, <laughs> we're like floating through space on this like planet with trees. Like it's all very cool to me, you know? So you're starting to sound like the Beatles, but go ahead. Right. <laughs> so I guess what I'm saying is like that shift in perspective. Yeah. Um, seems yeah. to be a really cool. Tool. It is. It is. And I guess like connecting it with other findings in psychology and in positive psychology about interventions. Yeah. Um, it yes. seems like 
maybe awe is a, is a good place to start before we, like, before trying to get people to have meaningful relationships or to engage with a new hobby that'll be great for them. Or wh before we try to do anything, it seems like you have to create the space for that change. Yeah. So I'm wondering yeah. if there's any work that, you, like, that you've done or that you know about, like, how, what happens after? So like you feel this awe. Yeah. And then is there, is there all of a sudden this like space for you to, to maybe say like, oh, maybe I can now pursue this venture that'll create. That's meaning. interesting. Because yeah. What do you do with like the vacuum that's created? Well, that's you know, and I think that the comments that Shinobu was offering about this interesting, um, you know, we're, the, we're this cultural animal and we're very interested in all the properties of collectives of religious practice and cultural values and where my identity folds into this collective. And you probably need some state that drives a lot of those assimilation processes. And awe is a good candidate, right? It's, and it's not coincidental that awe is very prominent in little kids as they learn things, in 18-year-olds as they learn about culture and really dig in. And so I think that's a, a very plausible thesis um, that we have a little bit of data related to. And then it becomes very important with interventions, right? Which is that, you know, get to awe first uh, and figure out what the direction to it is and then you'll get to the practices that follow. We are very interested in awe interventions based on this science. We've got one at UCSF on, one is with uh, very poor kids in Oakland getting them outdoors, five-year-olds. Another one is elderly at, through UCSF and looking at its relation to markers of dementia and I think they're going to, I think it's a very exciting intervention possibility. So, yeah. I'm oh, sorry. Josh. Uh, just a couple of half-formed ideas. So um, you mentioned, and this relates to, I think, a lot of what people have been saying so far. Um, you mentioned that awe is related to this, this um, small self idea and perhaps pushing people to connect with yeah. others and collective and so forth. But I'm wondering, is that... Is that sort of a primary outcome of all, or is that just sort of a consequence of sort of, does it stop at the collective, or is it really pushing people to just think really big hmm. about things? And collective yeah. is just a bigger way of looking at things, right? Yeah. It's like the, you're seeing the forest, but you're not, it's not necessarily about connecting with others. And so one, one question that might get at this a little bit is, do you have any data or thoughts on the consequences of awe for self-presentation, and whether or not it's, sort of interfering with the process of self-presentation. That's cool. That's really cool. So would I kind of show more flaws? We, we have a nice finding that, um, of Jenny Steller on the humility work that when I, experimental inductions of awe, I kind of hesitate more when I'm talking about strengths. I, I'm more modest and deferential. I take less time to talk about my strengths. So it, it tends to interfere with self-presentation, as you put it. I like your idea a lot, and you know that is it is it just that awe gets me to think about the culture and the collective, and all that it takes to fold into that. But but nature-based awe is is about ecosystem, right? So that's another big cognition, and both probably trigger this more general state that you're talking about. Um, I'd never thought about that. It's cool. I have a microphone now. <laughs> um, <laughs> So um, my fir the first part of my question is, <laughs> have you observed, I don't even know if it's working. <laughs> have, okay. Um, have you observed any individual differences or variation in people's tendency to recognize or feel awe? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then kind of relatedly thinking about the intervention that you guys are doing where you, where you bring veterans or kids from um, poor neighborhoods out on the river and put them in this really immersive, amazing yeah. experience. Are there ways to get people to recognize awe in their daily environments? And yeah. how might you leverage that for intervention? Like if they yeah. just notice a leaf on the sidewalk yeah. or a caterpillar that's, you know. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. How's a, a caterpillar going to be awe-inspiring? This <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> you know, is it possible to find awe in small things? And how do you yes. get people to recognize that? Yeah, that, that was one of the first counterexamples to the vastness claim. Because we do have uh, awe about small things. like. Guy wrote his name on a grain of rice, you know, and, and so, you know, and that is all inspiring and bugs, bugs and leaves and, you know, uh, so that, and, and that we'll have to figure out. Um, the, I, one of, you know, starting with Phoebe, I got really interested in 
how distinct emotions drive very specific patterns of cognition. And I know most of you would probably agree that when you come out of a big experience of awe, like everything is illuminated and beautiful and detailed and there is this perceptual state of, uh, it might be what you're talking about, of like, well, it's all interconnected, it's all animated by similar stuff. Or, and, and we have yet to um, really capture that. And, it's, and I, I think it's a fascinating process that it may be part of this epistemological state where you're figuring out complex causal systems like societies and ecosystems. Um, we, have, we have a great measure of individual differences in awe um, and uh, that Lonnie Shiota developed, who's at Arizona State now. And it's six items and it predicts everything, uh, you know, in the right direction and, and distinct from all the other positive emotions. One of our first studies was like, let's go find out what the dorm rooms are like about, of the awe-inspired person. And indeed, they are exactly what you think they would be looking like. For, you show up and they're hanging upside down and, you know, got weird art and stuff, but it predicts uh, so that'd be a good place to start. Um, one of our sets of findings shows that really awe-prone individuals are better scientific reasoners. It, it's and in these teleological reasoning tasks that are pretty complicated to solve. Um, and they just score better, replicated all kinds of times. Um, so their individual differences is a good way to go. Good there and their measures. Ethan. Great talk. Um, Thanks. And um, I'm just thinking about the intervention room. Yeah. And some of the long-term effects that you're getting, uh, I see what you mean. All right, unclear if this is working. Um, <laughs> so I mean, you leave the forest and you get back to the city, I know, and I then know. that drains. And so, how do you make sense of that? Yeah. I don't want you to answer that yet. I have an idea. Um, you've got data in their diaries on right. potentially what they're thinking about during the nature trips, and it occurs to me that Neat. what what the nature may be doing is shrinking the self and providing a space to reason about the traumatic event or whatever and and change the way they think about it in ways that might be cool you know, then be useful you yep. leave the memories changed right and, and right. buffered and so it might be really cool to look at that data as a potential um, predictor of more sensitive predictor of some of those long-term shifts i'm jotting down mental notes and we'll yeah. send that to my grad students tonight so thank you that's a great idea uh, and and it is it does raise the more general question. It's interesting um, how, and, and this is an untested area for the most part in emotion, is some emotions, like the, the decay of emotions over time is one part of it. And then, you know, how sadness doesn't seem to decay as quickly as, other, as another kind of emotion. And then how you, like, ah, oh, this is just an intuition compared to other emotions, seems to be easier to bring back, right, through a story or a reflection. And that may be a way to, uh, sort of a way to think, approach your really important question. In the intervention world, we do, you know, I'm talking right now to Outward Bound that wants to do a similar science. They get Outward Bound, three quarters of their students are scholarship students who are going backpacking for a week, learning a bunch of stuff, and how do they keep it, right? And so that's a neat, a neat way to think about how to cultivate that. Thanks. Uh, hi, I thought it was very interesting, some of the discussion about the uh, evolutionary function of awe. Yeah. And it made me think a bit about some of the findings, I think, by like Susskind and others that are um, thinking about how uh, certain emotions like fear and surprise just by their uh, physical properties on the face kind of open you up to yeah. more visual, sensory, auditory uh, sent information yeah. coming in. Uh, whereas, like, uh, disgust and others are sort of restricting your access to that That's information. Cool. So, uh, I was just kind of curious if uh, you felt like awe, which has kind of a more open sort of look to it, uh, kind of what, how you would place it in the context of those kinds of uh, other expressions. Yeah. I, I and I, I've only heard Secondhand accounts of that work, so I'll take a look at it. And I think that it, I, I put this up here because it is all opens, right? Literally, you know, people often, we started gathering this in narrative data and behavioral data. Your eyes open, your mouth opens, 
you, your posture opens, right? It's a very receptive emotion. It's so interesting to me, a lot, I think it's a universal that acts of, nonverbal acts of reverence are open, right? So um, I think that's, that's a nice converging characterization of why we, the display looks like, as it does. And it's not random, it is about gathering more stim information about the stimulus. So I'll look into it, it makes sense. So linking R to the, the collective and the lowering of the self, um, well, for me, then I see this, this link to morality. So yeah. how closely is a link to morality? Would it qualify as a moral emotion? Yeah. Uh, we, I have a student who is finding, we're starting to look at that question. And it's interesting, awe makes you, everything's more moral. Which, which is interesting in the moral foundations scale, which has its issues uh, and debates. Uh, it tends to, people when they feel awe tend to feel that all of the moral principles are more important. So it almost moralizes, mo and I think that that connects to thinking about the connection between awe and the sacred, which is the sacred is stuff you can't trade or sell or has to be protected. It's morally set apart from other realms of human life. Uh, and so, you know, A, it, it is most definitely a, a, an enabler of moral cognition. And then I think the question is, is how specific is it? Is it, is it just, is it culture specific? That'd be one hypothesis. It moralizes what I perceive to be salient in this culture, this tribe. Or is it, does it trigger some universal moral concept like egalitarianism? And we don't know. So it's a, 